Richard Kuklinski, the Mafia, Iceman born Richard Leonard Kuklinski in Jersey City, New Jersey. He started murdering in 1948 at age 13 and didn't stop until he was arrested in 1986. He was convicted of six murders, but experts seem certain he is responsible for at least dozens more, and possibly as many as 300. In taped interviews recorded in prison, he speculates that he probably killed as many as 100, 200 people. And what's most chilling is that his tone is that of a man who's estimating how many hot dogs he's eaten over his lifetime. Kuklinski killed people with guns, chainsaws, bombs, hand grenades, ice picks, and his bare hands. More than anything else, though, he loved to take people out with cyanide. Often, he'd spike their food with cyanide, and they'd die right there at the burger joint. But his favorite method of administering cyanide was with a liquid spray. You spray it on someone's face and they go to sleep, he explained with his trademark emotionlessness. Ultra-violent family, Kuklinski's brother was murdered by their maniac father. If you ask Kuklinski what made him that way, which is exactly what forensic specialist Dr. Park Dietz did in a 2002 prison interview, he blames it all on his father. If that sounds like an excuse, maybe you should learn a little bit more about his father. Kuklinski's father, Stanley, a vicious alcoholic, worked as a brakeman for a local railroad. He would routinely beat his wife Anna in front of the children. He would also beat Richard and his brother Florian so badly that he'd knock them both out. One day in 1940, he beat Florian to death and forced the family to tell everyone that his son had accidentally fallen down the stairs. Richard's younger brother Joey was in prison for raping a 12-year-old girl on a tenement rooftop, then throwing her and her dog off the roof to their deaths. Joey was 25 at the time of the murder. When asked why Joey did that, Richard replied, we come from the same father. His mother, who worked at a meatpacking plant, was a fanatically devoted Catholic who also frequently beat Richard, often with blunt objects. It is said that more than once she broke a broom handle while beating him with it. But nearly all of Richard's hatred hinged on his father's endless beatings and ritual humiliation. And just as he learned to disassociate himself from the emotional and physical pain his father rained down on him, he could also detach his mind from the pain of his countless victims. Not all of Kuklinski's murders were mafia hits and contract killings. Sometimes he just killed people who were acting like a loudmouth. His father was a loudmouth, so he hated all loudmouths. First murder. At age 13, Kuklinski turns from bullying victim to bully. Unfortunately for Kuklinski, his parents wouldn't be his only antagonists. As he entered adolescence, a local teenage gang named the Project Boys beleaguered him for repeated harassment and beatings. At age 13, for the first time in his life, Kuklinski decided to fight back. He grabbed a thick wooden hanging rod and went into the alley outside his apartment building to wait for the gang's leader, Charlie Lane, who he knew would be walking through the alley on his way home. As Charlie approached the alley, Richard positioned himself in his path. Charlie instructed him to move aside, to which Richard defiantly responded, Give it a shot. Charlie attempted, but his efforts were in vain. Kuklinski had thrashed him so hard with the thick wooden pole that he killed him. Knowing he needed to dispose of the body, he stole a car. Mind, you he was 13 at the time, and drove to a bridge near a remote South Jersey pond. He hacked off Charlie's fingertips with a hatchet and knocked out his teeth with a hammer before dumping his mutilated corpse in the pond. Later, he would track down all the members of the Project Boys and thrash each one of them to within an inch of their life. Then he formed his gang called the Coming Up Roses, who quickly established a reputation as a crew not to be fucked with, becoming a mafia hitman. As he entered adulthood, Kuklinski was a 6'5", 270-pound behemoth who was known to murder anyone who even slightly irked him. When he wasn't beating people to death with pool cues over billiards disputes, he formed a habit of heading from New Jersey into Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, where in the spring of 1954, he began randomly murdering transient men. It has been estimated that before the mob recruited Kuklinski as a contract murderer, he slew 65 men, never women, for reasons as petty as looking at him the wrong way. Since he was Polish, he could never truly become a made member of the Italian Mafia. 
but his effortlessness at killing soon caught the mob's attention. To test Kuklinski's mettle, Roy DeMeo, a member of the Gambino crime family, drove him to a city street one afternoon, randomly picked out a man walking his dog, and told Kuklinski to kill him. Without a word, Kuklinski got out of the car and shot the man in the back of the head, killing him. The problem with hiring Kuklinski as a money collector was that he was too eager to kill people, and when someone's dead, it makes it impossible for them to pay off their debts to the mafia. So instead, Kuklinski became a designated contract killer, and his legend grew to the point where in the 1970s, he was the world's most feared hitman. At first, the mafiosi referred to Kuklinski as the Polak. Then he became known as One Man Army and the Devil himself. One day, mobster Carmine Genovese directed Kuklinski to off someone. Impressed by how calmly Richard had handled his target, got back into the car, hit the gas, and John Wheeler reportedly looked at Richard, saying, Man, Rich, you're cold like ice. One of his sickest murder methods was to tie his victims up and leave them in caves populated by giant rats, who'd be drawn to them by the sounds of their screaming. Kuklinksy filmed at least one of his victims being eaten alive by rats. Upon viewing the film, Ted DeMeo, a ruthless murderer himself, couldn't finish watching and said that Kuklinski had no soul. After his conviction on six murder charges, Kuklinski gave several prison interviews dispassionately discussing many other murders for which he was never convicted that could short-circuit a normal person's brain due to their sheer savagery. Getting into the snow-covered parked car of mobster Bruno Latini one Christmas Eve, blowing his brains out and becoming temporarily blinded and deafened by the gun flash and sound, once his vision cleared, Kuklinski rifled through Latini's pockets, counted out the $1,600 Latini owed him, and left the rest for the man whose life he just ended, shooting a stranger in the head with a crossbow arrow just to see if a crossbow was an effective murder weapon. It was. Murdering a man who disrespected Carmine Genovese, Kuklinski knocked him out with one punch, hogtied and gagged him, put him in his car trunk, drove to the desolate New Jersey Pine Barrens, broke his knees, chipped off his fingers one by one with a hatchet, and finally decapitated him, returning the head to Genovese as a trophy. Dressing up in a flamboyant yellow costume to pose as a gay man in a NYC disco in the 1970s. When Kuklinski closed in on his target, he subdued him with a substance that immediately gave him a heart attack, which was fatal. Seeking revenge on a man who had disrespected him at a bar, Kuklinski waited until the man came outside and fell asleep in his car. He then threw a lit gasoline can into the vehicle, burning the man alive. The murder of accomplice Robert Prange, a.k.a. Mr. Softy. Prong drove a Mr. Softy ice cream truck selling treats to children while he was scoping neighborhoods to perform his own contract killings. He was the one who introduced Kuklinski to the ease at which cyanide allowed one to murder. He also allegedly helped Kuklinski store a corpse in a freezer in his truck. His mistake was asking Kuklinski to kill Pranja's wife and kids. Despite all Kuklinski's deeds, the mere suggestion of killing one's family members set him into a moral tizzy. Prong was found shot dead in his Mr. Softy truck, pausing amid murdering a man to allow him to pray to God, then waiting a half hour announcing that God obviously didn't care, and killing the man anyway. Of all his murders, Kuklinski said this was the only one where he felt he'd been unnecessarily cruel. But Kuklinski would never be tried or convicted for any of these murders. And as far as his family and neighbors knew, he was nothing more than a successful businessman who loved his family. Richard Kuklinski, family man. While already married with two children, 26-year-old Richard Kuklinski met 19-year-old Barbara Padrisi at a dock where they were both employed. Despite being married, he was captivated by Barbara. He began courting her, and although she initially fell for his charms, she soon found him too controlling and suffocating. According to Barbara, one day while they were sitting in a car, she expressed her desire to see other people. In response, Kuklinski began stabbing her in the back with a knife, telling her that he owned her and threatening to kill her and her entire family if she left him. When she screamed at him, he choked her until she lost consciousness. Despite this violent episode, 
Kuklinski returned the next day with flowers and an apology, and Barbara took him back. Kuklinski eventually divorced his wife and married Barbara, with whom he had two daughters and a son. Richard did not repeat his father's violence towards his children. However, he subjected his wife Barbara to horrific abuse. Despite a possible mental illness, he was responsible for his actions. The abuse escalated to the point where Barbara and her daughter Kristen felt driven to consider poisoning him. Still, the family says they have no idea Richard was a universally feared hitman. Barbara, unaware of the full extent of her husband's dark side, acknowledged Richard's contrasting personalities, referring to them as Good Richard and Bad Richard. Richard Kuklinski, the notorious hitman who prided himself on his meticulous methods, began to make careless mistakes as he aged into his 50s. Ironically, it would be ice, not his usual precision, that would lead to his downfall. The Iceman Crumbles, Arrest and Murder Convictions In the mid-1980s, Kuklinski's price for murder had risen to the high five figures. He'd become such a sought-after killer that he distanced himself from the mafia and went into the murder business for himself. It was almost always deadly to do business with Kuklinski. He covered his tracks so thoroughly, he wound up killing nearly every friend who knew anything about his crimes, especially if they had been accomplices. In 1985, an ATF agent arranged with mafia informant Phil Salimine, one of Kuklinski's only close friends, to introduce him to an undercover agent named Dominic Polyphrone, whose phone recordings of Kuklinski asking him if he knew where to get more cyanide so he could kill more people would seal his murder convictions. Solomain was the only friend that Kuklinski didn't kill, and he was the one who betrayed him the worst. In all of Kuklinski's murder convictions, except that of Paul Calabro, he became the prime suspect because he was the last person known to have seen them all alive. Paul Hoffman, shot and beaten with a tire iron. In the spring of 1982, Richard Kuklinski planned with a pharmacist named Hoffman to obtain a shipment of ulcer medication through illegal channels. When Hoffman arrived with $25,000 cash, Kuklinski killed him. He cemented his body inside a steel drum and left it next to a New Jersey hot dog stand, which he'd frequently visit just to eat hot dogs and look at the steel drum until it was eventually removed. Louis Masque shot Masque's corpse which Kuklinski had kept in an industrial freezer for two years after shooting him in the head in 1981, was what led police to start calling Kuklinski the Iceman. After investigators uncovered the cadaver in rural New York State in the summer of 1983, a medical examiner noticed that there were ice crystals still thawing in Mosguy's heart. This was not a recent murder, and Kuklinski became the prime suspect. Paul Maliband shot a mob associate who'd worked with Kuklinski in the dirty business of bootlegging pornography tapes. Maliband infuriated his partner by showing up unannounced at Kuklinski's house one day, violating the strict separation of family and business. When Kuklinski expressed anger at this, Maliband threatened to kill his family. Kuklinski shot him five times, killing him. He stuffed Maliband's 300-pound body into a steel drum and rolled it over a cliff. When asked later why Maliband was murdered, Kuklinski gave a slight grin and said, he outlived his usefulness. Richard Smith, poisoned, strangled. While running car theft scams with a man named Gary Deppner, Kuklinski conspired to kill their associate Gary Smith by feeding him a cyanide lace burger at a New Jersey motel. Smith didn't die as easily as expected, and Deppner wound up strangling him with a light cord. Kuklinski and Deppner concealed his body under the mattress and left. It wasn't until four days later that the smell of decomposition became so unbearable that people noticed there was a dead body under the motel bed. Gary Deppner, likely cyanide. Since Deppner knew too much, Kuklinski appears to have poisoned him with cyanide, wrapped him in plastic bags, and dumped him in a rural area where his body was found being eaten by a turkey vulture in May 1983. Peter Calabro, shotgun killing. On a wintry night in 1980, cloaked in darkness, Kuklinski waited for hours as Sammy the Bull Gravano, reportedly his accomplice, watched for the arrival of Peter Calabro's car. When Calabro's car approached, Kuklinski emerged from his hiding place and blasted Calabro with a shotgun. 
Unbeknownst to Kuklinski, Calabro was a cop. This was the only murder conviction not linked to Kuklinski's original murder trial. In 2003, he agreed to plead guilty to Calabro's murder in exchange for testifying against Gravano. FBI agents arrested Richard and Barbara Kuklinski at their home in a surprise raid on a cold morning in 1986. In exchange for a deal in which authorities agreed not to prosecute his wife for aiding and abetting his crimes, Kuklinski pled guilty to two murders, eventually being convicted of all six. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. At 70, his health deteriorated rapidly. After falling into a coma, Barbara made the difficult decision to withhold resuscitation. She says her only regret was not telling him how much she hated his guts. It is said that even Kuklinski's relatives suspect that he did not die of natural causes and was instead poisoned by mobsters who feared his testimony against Sammy Gravano. In the end, Kuklinski died alone, hated and betrayed, just the way his father would have wanted it. The Iceman. In his own words. By now you know what I liked most was the hunt, the challenge of what the thing was. The killing for me was secondary. My friend, there's more than one way to do it. There's more than one way to skin something. I am probably the loneliest person in the world because I have nothing I care for. I've never felt sorry for anything I've done other than hurting my family. I do want my family to forgive me. I'm not the ice man. I'm the nice man. Thanks so much for tuning in today, friends. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. If there's anyone special you'd love us to delve into next time, drop their name in the comments below. We're always eager to hear your thoughts, so don't hesitate to share them. And remember, your support means the world to us. So go ahead, give that like button a smash, hit subscribe, and spread the word by sharing this video with your circle. Until we meet again, keep the curiosity alive. With love, the Midnight Society.